I said good afternoon. Thank you. All right. So I was invited to do this talk, and uh, if you saw the name of it, um, I actually had nothing to do with that name, so I apologize. I don't think there's going to be a war coming on. But um, I do think AI is very important. Uh, I've actually been building AI chips since uh, 2012, so 13 years. So I've seen this for uh, quite a while coming. Um, I think one of the more surreal moments I had was when I was um, uh, just sitting in a, a taxi and I heard the taxi driver talking on the phone about AI. And that was a moment where I realized it was starting to become real, and especially with the chat GPT moment that came. So one of the reasons that I get asked to do these talks is I have an unusual ability to make AI simple. And so you've heard a lot of things about how AI is going to be disruptive. You've heard about how it's going to cause job losses, how there's going to be opportunities, and how scary it is. My goal today, and what you can hold me accountable to being on stage, is making a lot of what's going on in AI much clearer. So let's start off with um, uh, an interesting question, which is, is AI a bubble? Or is it real? So. A couple months ago, I was invited to do a talk at Goldman Sachs' inaugural Abu Dhabi event. Uh, at this event, there were 50 to 60 hedge fund managers, and every single one of them managed more than $10 billion. So that's 500 to $600 billion, probably over a trillion dollars represented there. I was the only tech founder invited to um, answer some questions about AI. And um, when they brought me on stage, uh, the first question they asked was, is AI a bubble? And I said, I think you're thinking about this the wrong way. Um, you're thinking of it in terms of economic terms. You're thinking about, I put money in and I get an ROI out. Right now, the tech companies, uh, let's start with um, Google. So Google spending $65 billion a year. Uh, I think Facebook spending $65 billion a year. Uh, Amazon is spending $100 billion a year. Microsoft spending $70, $75 billion a year. Those are just four tech companies. Now, let's throw in some countries. Um, so we just deployed 20,000 chips in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is going to be spending over $30 billion in the near future. Uh, I was just in Japan. I met with the Minister of Economic Security for Japan. He surprised me by telling me that they had just uh, approved a $65 billion budget for AI compute. Okay, why? Well, when I was talking to the hedge fund managers, I asked, uh, who in this room thinks that in 10 years, it is 100% guaranteed that you will be able to outperform AI in picking stocks? Zero hands went up. So I said, okay, if you're a tech company and you write software and AI is already helping your software engineers write much better software, that it's already producing code without any human intervention that's going into production. 10 years from now, can you afford to have not spent $100 billion a year on AI? And then it made sense. This isn't purely economical. This is geopolitical. What happens if someone else is able to produce more compute than you can? So you're hearing the word compute a lot. Let's explain what compute is. And let's put it in terms that we're all familiar with. So um, if a country fought a war over oil, we wouldn't be too shocked. In fact, it's happened before. And the reason is energy is uh, economic capability. If you have energy, you can have mechanical advantage, you can build things. Um, if you don't have energy, then your civilization grinds to a halt. Prices escalate, you can't build uh, goods, and you can't trade. What I was asked was, is AI going to be the next internet? And the question uh, was interesting, but the answer is absolutely not. And the reason is, AI um, is... is uh, a little bit different than the internet. The internet is about replicating data with high fidelity and distributing it across the world. That's an information age technology. It's actually very similar to the telephone. It's um, very similar to the uh, telegraph. 
It's the same technology, but of a different degree than the printing press. Replicate, distribute. AI is actually not an information age technology. AI is about creating something in the context that's actually never been seen before. With information uh, technology, it's about storing things. With AI, it's about generating things. If you do not have compute, you actually cannot generate things. So just like you need fuel to run an industrial economy, you need compute. And if you don't have that compute, you cannot have AI. So we've met with uh, over 100 companies in the last 72 hours here in India, and do you know what the number one concern was? Getting enough compute affordably. It, you can have the best AI model in the world, but if you don't have compute, you cannot deploy it. So right now, if you are an Indian tech company, an entrepreneur, and you want to build an AI company, you have to compete with everyone else to get that compute. Now, every year, NVIDIA builds about 5.5 million GPUs. If they had the ability to build 20 million, they would sell 20 million. That means that it's completely supply constrained. And when a hyperscaler says they want to buy a million GPUs, which is, by the way, how many Google's deploying this year, if you had an order in, you go to the back of the list. So let's bring in another term, sovereign AI. Sovereign AI is really just a way to say, we need to be able to control access to compute just like we control access to energy. Just like you have energy security, you need compute security. And this is a new concept. Now, there's another word that's being used a lot, which is disruption. So why are we so concerned about disruption with AI? Well, one of the main um, con contributors of AI is the ability to um, do work that previously was very expensive and can fundamentally change the economics of a business. When you see the valuations of these AI companies, they all seem like they're overvalued. I mean, it's kind of nuts. Like OpenAI, granted, their, run, uh, their revenue has been growing to the point where they're making a billion dollars a month now. But a billion dollars a month normally wouldn't uh, be worth a $300 billion valuation. Uh, we see tech startups, AI startups, that get funded for a billion dollars uh, right out of the gate. That's their seed round. That's before they've generated any revenue. How does that make sense? Well, it's not just the value of the company. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier of disruption. The startups aren't just adding to the economy. What's happening is the investors are looking at all of those other companies that exist and saying that the value of those companies is going to transfer to these AI startups. So that's the risk. But there's an opportunity with risk. So right now, if you look at the top 10 tech companies in the United States, um, three of them uh, are led by Indians. So when we first arrived here, we kept getting asked over and over again, why are you in India, given that all the spend is in the US and, and Europe and these other places? And my answer was, well, those 10 tech companies where three of them are led by Indians, I mean, if we said three years ago that Google was going to be at risk of being disrupted by a startup, we would have said, absolutely not. Now, if I ask you which startup is disrupting Google, what's your answer? I heard about ChatGPT, okay, OpenAI. Yeah, so there's perplexity, so they're at risk. So what that means is, right now, um, there's an opportunity to change the top 10 tech companies. In five years, I would be surprised if any of the current tech companies are on the top 10 still. So instead of it being three uh, CEOs who are Indian of tech companies, why not three companies that are founded by Indians that are in the top 10? And that's why we're here. All right, thank you.